This week on Let Me Be Frank, we're going to take a little bit of a breath here in Lent um, and answer a mailbag full of listener questions. So those are ahead. Your questions for Bishop Frank Caggiano. So keep your radio here at 1350 AM and 103.9 FM to hear them or keep us on your phone with the Veritas mobile app. And if you're listening to Let Me Be Frank on podcast, go to your favorite podcast app and be sure to rate us, review us, give us five stars and help us reach more souls. Thank you very much to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, good always, oh, good always to see you, and um, today we're going to have some fun, I think. This should be fun. Yes, it's nice uh, nice and lighthearted. We, we've we been serious the past couple of weeks with the guests and things, and so... Um, yes, yes. <laughs> and, and, and it's the Easter is coming, the Easter bunny is coming. <laughs> <laughs> we're just so sad, but I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we should have have a little fun. Yeah. We, we do listener questions. And these questions, some of them are, are hysterical. Yes. Yeah, I don't <laughs> – it's funny to see what people are, are thinking about as they as they listen. But um, I know. <laughs> well, so then let's get to it. Yep, okay. Absolutely. Here is question number one, Excellency. It says, I know it's speculation and a moot point, but what do you think would have happened if Mary said no at the time of the Immaculate Conception? Well, you see, it's a very interesting question. I know what the person is asking, but the Immaculate Conception, Mary didn't have a choice either way, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. right? Right. <laughs> when she was conceived in the womb of her mother, Anne, she was given the the, the grace, the extraordinary grace of not being afflicted yes. pe- with the original sin. Yes. So it's really the Annunciation. The annunciation yes. Right. Well, that's, a, that's a, actually a very interesting question that theologians through the centuries have asked, and of course it's pure speculation, but it's it's almost like um, the concept of a possible impossibility. So something is theoretically possible, but in fact would have been unthinkable, one could even say impossible to happen, because everything that Our Lady lived for, everything that she was formed in her sinlessness, and she did not contribute in any way to, a, to, to, to anything other than her sinlessness by her virtue and her faith. And her, to, to say you're going to choose something that would have been no to God would have been so out of character, so out of formation, that is it theoretical, I suppose, but in fact, it's a functional impossibility. Hmm. If everything you're you're living is going in one direction, right, right, but Our Lady was still human. But yeah, so the answer is that is why it's a moot point. I agree. Yeah. It is a moot yeah. point. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. <laughs> this next question <laughs> it says um, it says I assume that Steve has been to one of your masses. Have you ever gone to one of Steve's soccer games? <laughs> No, the answer is no. I was never been invited. This is everybody knows now oh that I was never invited. I pay money to see you play soccer. <laughs> Just for the record, for everybody hearing me, that could be your fundraiser in May, right? <laughs> Where you have your gala. But I'd like to see you on the field. It, I would. If you, <laughs> if somebody paid money to see me play soccer, that would actually make me a professional for that moment, right? Because I'm getting paid. You, to do see, it. see, you re, you realize your dream. You raise money. <laughs> I'd have some laughs, and we're all happy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm sure you're a great player. <laughs> Excellency, you know. So okay, so here we go. Your schedule is crazy, but here's an open invitation to you to come to watch Cardinal Kung Academy, the team that I coach. One Friday uh-huh. afternoon in the fall. Now, wh- when would they play? In the morning at uh, night? In the, uh, in the afternoons in the, in the fall. So September or October um, at 4 o'clock 
p.m. Ah. at that field. And you coach Car- – I didn't realize you coach Card Lucon. I do, yeah. Last year, Excellency, we went 10-3. Uh, and three. We only lost three games. And we outscored our you. opponents over the course of the season. We outscored our opponents 56-17. to 17. Look at you with the smile. You can't see this. I can see the smile. Whoa. I'm so proud boys of my boys. Little devilish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but now listen. Yes. But you coach other teams too. Or do you coach other? That's because that's you? the main team that I coach now, the high school boys team. And okay, we play against other private okay. high schools. So, Okay. Wow. Good yeah. for you. Yeah, Good for fun. you. It's all about teams. Yes, it is. Yep. It is. So, yeah. Okay. Let's move on. <laughs> all right. Mm-hmm. James, John, Luke. Matthew, Philip, Thomas, Stephen, Mary, Martha, etc. Not exactly typical Jewish names today. And according to the mm-hmm. internet, which uh, admittedly is fallible, not typical. To say the least. <laughs> say To say the least. Uh, these names are not typical for Jesus' time either. How could this be? Well, I have a question. D- do you speak Korean? A little bit, yes. Yes. So what is Steve... The equivalent of Steve in Korean, do you know? Uh, so, so uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know. I don't think there's an equivalent. I think they just would use there is the it. Christian Steve. Right. Yeah. S- Steve. Right. The reason I say that is because, so if you look at my name, Frank, mm-hmm. is very dramatic, mm-hmm. but that my name is also Francisco or Francesco or Franco, depending on what cultural language you're talking yes. about. And I would love to know what's in Korean, but that's all the story. <laughs> all right. So um, the names that these have been anglicized. So Miriam is very yes. Jewish, can be translated as Mary in English. So we, so the person needs to remember, whoever this is, is that it, they've been anglicized so that they're familiar to us, but it's not necessarily what it said in their original languages. So the word Jesus, the name Jesus, is many times as Joshua. But we speak in English, we'd say Jesus. So I think in the end, that's where the disconnect is, that they're actually just anglicizing the original names. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know in Korean, mm-hmm. like they call John uh, Johan, I think. So. Oh, d- d- so it would be the uh, Latin version. Is that Latin? Okay. <laughs> I would think, yeah. Johannes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here's another uh, question uh, about the internet. Uh, the, re- the writer uh, writes in I just watched a YouTube video that the Pope's bakery is closing. <laughs> it's a big. I didn't know there was one. <laughs> Apparently, so he so he wrote. Uh, it's a bakery that made bread specifically for the last five popes, um, and they put the bread in a lockbox and give it to a nun who had the only key. Could you imagine? <laughs> Feels like a lot, the, a lot of work. Is, is this really I true? I, I, that, that's. <laughs> I think that's really a riot. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah it's wow. I mean, so. But here's the question. The question says, if you were Pope, uh, what bread would you request? Oh, Ooh, I'll answer if you answer it. Okay, you yes. ready? My favorite bread is cinnamon raisin Ooh. bread. Nice. Yeah. I, and, and now, because I'm on a diet that's actually working finally, <laughs> I eat Ezekiel bread every morning. Have you ever no, heard of it? No, what is that, Excellency? Ezekiel bread is a bread that follows the formula that's found, I believe, in the fourth chapter of the prophecy of Ezekiel and how they made bread. And there's no flour in the bread, no flour. It's seven grains that have been sprouted that they make bread out of, and it's frozen in the in the in the second when you go to the supermarket. It's like where you would have the frozen pancakes and the waffles and all that stuff. It calls and it comes in different f- 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 forms. And there's a cinnamon raisin Ezekiel bread. Honestly, it is it is it is not flour. It has no yeah. flour. It is one of the most delicious bread I have really? ever tasted in my life. But it's tiny. It's eighty calories. I'm trying to lose weight, <laughs> but it's um, yeah. So, but cinnamon raisin in general, I love it. Now, if my father were alive, you know how he would answer this? 
lard bread. So what is Have that? Have you ever had oh, lard I don't know bread? What that is either. No, it's bread that has basically embedded into it is literally lard. That's part of the ingredient that's made with it instead of like the olive oil is. So it's, I mean, it's delicious. Mm. It will kill you if you eat a lot right. of it. But, you know, it's quality and quantity of life. That's the <laughs> yes. way my father used to look yeah. at it. <laughs> now, what, what's your answer to that question? So it's uh, a little involved. So I've been for about almost 15 years, I've been gluten-free and dairy-free. But my mouth still waters when I think of like Italian garlic knots. Oh, mm. So you haven't had them in all yeah. those years? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Gosh, your I my respect for you has gone up big time. <laughs> I, I, or or <laughs> so in and, and gluten free, that means like no pasta or just gluten free pasta. pasta right? It's not the same thing. What about rice? rice. Is, is there no, I can have rice? rice. Yep. Oh, so there's no gluten in rice. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> Wow. All right, let's keep going. Okay, mm -hmm. it's the next question. Uh, which figure from the Bible do you most relate to? And yeah. Oh, uh, well, I mean, to, uh, my immediate answer, if we're, if we're talking about the Old Testament, right? It would be Moses. A flawed sinner who was given leadership, who did his best to lead God's people forward in a vision and please God was humble enough to just see them as they went off into the future without necessarily have to walking with them to into that mm. future. Right. That is, as I've told that story that has animated my episcopacy for all these 18 years. Right? But the fact that he's a flawed man and he's a sinner, actually Moses was a big sinner, right? He was a murderer. I'm not a murderer. Just like if anybody's wondering, there's no, there's no analogy there. <laughs> All right? There's a limited analogy, but um, it gives me great comfort. Now, if you add the New Testament, who would you, who would you answer? From the New Testament, I think I would say Peter. Um, yeah, I would, I would yeah. agree. Because he's a flawed yeah. man. He was also a sinner. Right? He betrayed the Lord to his face. And yet he also gathered the people, the first Christians together, rallied them, preached with, with heroism, conviction, and then he paid the price. But I'm sure as he was dying, he could glimpse with God's mercy that this, this was going to take a life of its own. He, he left it in good hands kind of yes. thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another biblical kind of kind of biblical question <laughs> it says uh yeah uh, if one night while resting you hear a voice that says bishop frank this is god the bible has an error when it was written as you know there were 12 apostles 12 tribes of israel 12 minor prophets and 12 cakes placed in the tabernacle well there were actually 12 commandments what do you think those mm -hmm. other two commandments would be you know i i chose this question for us to talk about because I can figure out one of the two. I'm stumped at number two. And the one that I would add is a direct response to what we're experiencing in the modern world. So it would be to seek unity of mind and heart as the 11th mm -hmm. commandment, because we are far too divided and we are far we have drunk too much of the modern world's Kool-Aid, even in the church. And the church, one of the marks, it actually the first of the marks of the church is that it is one. Yes. One. Yes. Right? But for a twelfth, I was stumped. You want to give me a hand here? I I do you have any suggestions? Uh, I mean Let me think. Uh as a parent, I would say the twelfth would be a repeat of the fourth. Honor your father and mother. Uh, that's no fair. <laughs> no, it would be you. Honor yeah, your yes, father exactly. And mother. It would be Andrew, Christopher, and Annabelle. <laughs> honor your father and mother. <laughs> mother. Ooh, these kids. Wow. Oh, man. I, 
if they weren't great kids, I couldn't be laughing about them. <laughs> I know. Uh, In many ways, you know, if you look at the commandments, the the last seven are all about our neighbor. Yes. Right? And the first few are about the about our relationship with God. Yes. So if you look at it, there's a lot of things about our relationship with our neighbors that God could have commanded us. In fact, are included in the commandments that are there. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I like this. Can you imagine if that was told by the church? By the way, there are two more. Could you imagine? The oh, no, boy. No, <laughs> Let's not start anything. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, right. gosh. Okay. I, I really like this next one. It says, uh, Bishop Frank, if you became Pope, what would your first decree or act be? Oh, gosh. Uh Increase everybody's pay. That would be great. That would make you popular overnight. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I've always joked about this. I don't have to do this in public. But, but you know, to declare all of those mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and everybody who's raised up, all, the, all of us, who are the quiet, unknown saints, to declare a day when we pray for them, Right, that would be in my mind a tremendous yeah. thing to recognize the the sanctity that we grew up with. Not, not everybody had it, right? And it was again flawed mm -hmm. people, but in some way, shape, or form, to recognize that would have been a great thing. You know, I joked I make my mother a saint. I would announce I would be three people in St. Peter's myself, my sister. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that, but I don't have to. I mean, I know my yeah. mother is a saint. I know, I know it. And my father's in heaven because of my mother. I mean, it's just how it works. We're going to get each other into heaven yes. sooner or later. So I, 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 it's not going to happen. So I'm not sure I have to answer the question. <laughs> good. That's good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, next question. Uh, is there any rationale for the gospel order of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or was it an arbitrary call back in the Middle Ages? No, it was actually earlier than the Middle Ages when the canon was created, which would have been in the fourth century. I think in Nicaea, in the in the uh, in the uh, decretals of Ni Nicaea, it, it starts speaking about the canon. But the truth is, Matthew has the privileged place in part because it was until modern biblical study, it was it was presumed to be the oldest of the of the Gospels. Actually. Modern biblical study has helped us to understand that that is not the case, that Mark is the oldest of the four. And there was additional material that came in called the Q source that was added by the evangelists on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit into the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. So the other interesting thing about St. Matthew's Gospel, it is the most Jewish of the four. So if you're looking at a thematic development under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. St. Matthew has the greatest Jewish roots, and St. John has the most developed theological reflection on the mystery of the incarnation and paschal mystery of the Lord. So there's many ways to see it, but in fact, it, the, the, the general pre prevalent belief was that St. Matthew's was the oldest. Yeah. That's why it's yeah. the first. You can read mm -hmm. them in whatever order you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, of course. But it's interesting. The Bible's just, it, it, but they're still ordered yes. this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the bed I lay upon. So you can't move John. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. So you can move the other three, but don't move John. <laughs> the other three go together anyway as the synoptics. So <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Let me ask you this. Can I ask you a question? Uh oh. Based on this, which is your favorite gospel? Which of the four? Oh gosh. So they're all actually so different. I think mm -hmm. oh, how do I pick one? Uh, I'll say oh gosh, John. <laughs> <laughs> when when defaulting, yes, go to John. Yeah, exactly. No, actually, uh, 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 the only reason I asked you a question, I didn't yes. mean to put you on the spot, but in my heart of hearts, I've always had a special place for St. Luke's mm. Gospel, right? Because of all the beautiful stories, the parables that are related in Jesus' ministry there. And it's all about lives that are a little bit wrecked 
that Jesus, yes. you know, teaches us about the mercy and the yeah. healing and right. Yeah. Right. So it's it's and he's the physician. Yes. Yep. Luke. Yep. So it's all about it's it's the theme of healing is all throughout his gospel. Which again, not that it is it has a privileged place per se, but in a world that needs a tremendous amount of healing, I could see why Saint Luke, at least for me in my pro in my prayer, Saint Luke seems to be on my mind more than the other yeah. three. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh let's see. Next question. Um why do you think bread and wine was chosen by our blessed Lord as the symbol of our offertory? Why doesn't the priest consecrate the bread and wine together? So two questions. Well, because I think, yeah, because I think in the end, the roots of the mass are rooted in the Passover celebration. Right? There are some scholars who debate whether or not the Last Supper was actually the Passover meal. But in fact... I'm not sure what the basis of that disputation is, but in fact, the tradition has held for a very long, from the, moment, the beginning, that it was the Passover meal. And there is an offering of unleavened bread, and there's an offering of a cup in the Passover, and they are not done together. Is that ultimately where we see our Jewish roots, right? So I think that's the issue. And of course, the unleavened bread goes back to Exodus, and the liberation of God's people when they were told to, with the kill, right with the slaying of the firstborn sons, and they had to leave, and they put their their their, their dough, which they didn't have time to rise, on their shoulders. Off they went, and that was the tradition of the liberation of the Jews. And now in Christ is liberation of all creation, and so it's unleavened bread, and it has to be unleavened bread, matter and form, mm -hmm. matter. It has to be unleavened bread. It has to be wheat based. It cannot be rice based. There has to be, there is no such thing as totally gluten free bread for consecration. They have to leave a minuscule amount for it to be valid. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. And please, God, for those who have allergies, it's so small that it won't make a difference to the allergy, but there has to be at least some semblance of it for it to be valid. So I think it's from the Passover meal. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, do bishops perform marriage ceremonies and funerals for regular people? Well, I, well, first of all, I've done them for my relatives, and I'm not sure they are considered rel <laughs> regular people. Depends on who we're talking about. Okay, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, I would, I would think so. I have. You know, it's fine. maybe I shouldn't say this on the podcast, but every. Every request that a person has called my office to say, Bishop, we met you here, Bishop, we done, and you know what? We'd really be honored if you would witness our marriage. Every single request but one I have wow. fulfilled. And I yeah. love it. Oh, I love it. But now, if I get 100 requests, the answer is I can't possibly do <laughs> yeah. it. That's one of the things I miss about being a pastor in a parish. Because... It, a par a, when you're a pastor and you get to know your people and they get to know you, those celebrations are so beautiful, especially if you're a pastor yeah. for a while. So you confirm young people. And then if they decide to marry at a younger age, you actually witness their marriage. Some of the pastors of our diocese who were in parishes for a long time went from baptism to marriage. What a blessing. Yeah. Isn't it? And you feel like you're part of the family in a way. You really are. Like you kind of walk with – that's the, it's the beauty of priestly ministry. But, yes, I've done it. And, of course, I was joking about my relatives. <laughs> I, I've celebrated the funerals. Not as much in the last years, Yeah, to be very honest. And even in my family, for example, when my aunt died, who n did not live in New York, for whatever reason, my cousins decided to have no funeral mass. Hmm which was very disturbing to me, but not my, it was really not my role to say yeah. anything. This was yeah. years ago. So, um, so, I, so I didn't celebrate all of them, even in my family, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Back in uh, mm -hmm. uh, 1998, when my mom passed away, um, Bishop Egan mm -hmm. showed up at the funeral and uh, oh, he didn't wow. celebrate, but, uh, but he sat, you know, apart and, uh, yeah, participated. I guess so. Yeah. Was, yeah, it, it's presiding. Yes. It was. Right? 
You know, again, it, uh, well, for, thank you for sharing that that memory. And um, again, for our listeners, if a bishop comes to mass and there is another bishop, and that bishop presides, he can come mm-hmm. celebrate. If a bishop comes to mass and there is a priest scheduled to celebrate, that can't happen because the fullness of the priesthood lies with the bishop. So if a bishop comes to mass, he either must must be the celebrant of the mass or he presides. And what that means is he doesn't celebrate mass. He receives Holy Communion, as everyone else does, and he presides in the sanctuary off to the side like Bishop Egan did when your mom yeah. was buried. But I can't con- celebrate a mass with priests and the priest being the principal celebrant because the e- e- ecclesiology right. doesn't work. Huh. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can squeeze one more quick one in before the break, Excellency. Yep. Uh, let's see. I notice you say, please God, often while speaking. Is that meant to be a two-word prayer? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. It's one of the many techniques to realize the mandate to pray without ceasing. Right. Awesome. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so I'm glad people yeah, picked that up. It's... I got to watch what I say now. <laughs> Remember, Bishop said that thing about his family. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, my family called me. Never mind anybody else. I was joking, joking, joking. All right. Let's let's take a break, and we'll be back with more of your questions on the other side of the break. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. All right, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. All right, Excellency, we're cooking through these questions, so uh, we'll, just, we'll just pick up where we left off. Okay, next one. Uh, we've heard that you enjoy fall and the gloom of a rainy day. Amen fits my personality it's perfect (laughs) do you have a favorite time of day like the wee hours of the morning high noon dusk or the burning candle at midnight and what about a day of the week yeah um i'm a morning person without a doubt i've always been a morning person like even when i was in high school i would rarely rarely sleep past 6 30 a.m i was always up early but now I'm much earlier than that. So, for example, today we're yes. taping, right? And I had mass early in the morning at the cathedral. So I got up a little before four. And all my prayers, my holy hour, all the rest, breakfast. And I was on the merit a little before wow. six. Oh, but it's like, it's so yeah. beautiful. When I stay in Brooklyn and come over, I get in my car to drive from Brooklyn at 4.25 a.m. And the bell, the white stone, I've said, it's so beautiful. The morning is quiet. It's recollected. No one's emailing. Well, usually nobody's emailing me, texting me, all this stuff. And I just find it so easy to rest with the Lord in that time. Especially 
when you get to that point where the sun, like now, as we get closer into April and you get on the merit, let's say at six o'clock, 6.15, and the sun is beginning to rise, but there's no traffic in front of you that can distract yes. you, right? It's just the morning is my favorite to, to pray, to read, all the rest. At night, yeah. <laughs> I never was, but even now by 8.30, yeah. I'm just, it, it doesn't yeah. function. The brain doesn't function. Now, what about oh, yourself? I can't. You just gave such a great answer. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that <laughs> I I would pick uh, early afternoon on a fall, cool and sunny day, and all it has all it has uh -huh. to do with is being outside in the weather. <laughs> so, oh, uh, you see, but that's it because that's yeah, and that's where you're. That's where you're in your element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the night, the gloom, the fall, it all fits. <laughs> It all fits. And I, 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 mentioned, I remember mentioning this in a podcast when we first started a thousand years ago. My, my homiest, like the, the coziest recollection I have was when I was a little boy and we were living above Manufacturers Hanover Trust on the third floor of this apartment building on the commercial strip Avenue U, U as in mm -hmm. Ulysses. And the heat would come up for the first time. And I, as a little boy, would be hanging over the the the, uh, the fire escape, looking at the people going oh, by. Cool. And it's just, yeah, and the, it, the sun was setting. It's just, I don't know. Anyway, now what day of the week? What day of the week? When I was a pastor, that was Sunday. As a bishop, it's a toss up between Saturday morning and Sunday morning mm. early early because they're both quiet saturday morning are all my chores that's when i clean the bathroom all the rest you know wash the floor sinks all that stuff i do that all saturday morning very early and then sunday morning is when i try to use that time for extra reflection and prayer especially in the fall go for a walk whatever but i enjoy both it's funny i just hmm. i'm very domestic <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. <laughs> I couldn't imagine if I was the wealthiest man on earth. I, and I say this with all if I was the wealthiest man on earth, I could not possibly have anybody do any of those things for me. I just it yeah. just doesn't fit me. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh let's see. Next question. Um, do you drink soda or alcohol? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I, I kept Coca-Cola in business <laughs> when I was a teenager. <laughs> I didn't know. Oh, I, I loved soda then, but now, nah. No, my, my doctor said to me, it's, you know, I told you, it's no more fooling around. He said, you're 65. You got coronary issues in your family. You got to get serious now. Stop. So uh, soda stopped years ago. Alcohol, well, I mean, I could I mean, I'm Italian. I mean, you have to have wine every now and then. I mean, it's just like be forsaking my my culture to live long. No, come on, it's not fair. But I don't yeah. drink much. Yeah, I don't. I don't. And my doctor recommended one glass of red wine every night. I don't do that. But yeah, but maybe yeah. twice a week, once a week, twice yeah. a week, Sundays. Red or white, Excellency, it has to be. And right, yourself? Right? Uh, no. Interesting. Interesting. Isn't that funny you say that? It depends on the red wine because it gives oh, me a headache. Okay. And and my doctor said to me, um, it's the sulfites in the wine. Depending on what the sulfites are, you could react. White wine may have sulfites, but white wine I've mm, never had an okay. issue with. Okay. So I would prefer red because it's healthier for you. But oftentimes I, def I defer yeah. to white too. Okay. Yeah, I drink. I. But who's yeah. picky? Right. I mean, it's, it's what wine. it is. And you? I drink. I drink a lot it's of wine. Coke still. Um, I do. Do you I, really? And it drives Rula nuts that I drink so much Coke, but I, I just love it. And, and you're so athletic and health conscious and all the rest. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the people at Atlanta are so happy to hear you say that. <laughs> uh, you're going to be on their yeah, next right. commercial. <laughs> and I do, I do drink some wine and beer and definitely bourbon, but all in moderation. 
except the Coke. The Coke's not in moderation. Yeah. Everything in moderation, nothing in moderation can really do you tremendous harm. Provided that we're not talking yeah, stuff that's right. crazy, but you know. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, related, uh, in the next question says, what was the favorite meal that you had, that your mother made for you? And has anyone ever come close uh, to making that since? Okay. I'll answer it. You answer it after me. My mother used to make escarole and sometimes put beans in it. So escarole or escarole and bean that I would give my left hand now to have it again. And nobody, nobody has replicated how my mother would make it. And the funny thing is when I was growing up, I had a sweet tooth. I loved pastries, cookies, cake, bread. I, but I would give all that up if my mother made escrow. Wow. And most kids would say escrow. Who would want to eat that? <laughs> yeah. But I, and to this day, yeah. I mean, I have it. And I and, and people have, you know, there's some people who send it to me that it comes like 99% wow. to my mother's, yeah. which is tremendous. And maybe it's just my psychology that I know it's not my mother's, so you don't get to 100%, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, and that's and that's peasant food in some sense. I mean, wow. in Italy, you know, that you would raise escarole in the farms and, and you would, with the beans, you'd have your protein and all the rest. But yeah. it's so delicious. Yeah. <laughs> now, what about uh, you? Let's see. I think a lot, but the, the the dish that comes first to mind is um, it's a a stew. It's called kalbi tang, and it's um, it's a very hearty and and rich Korean stew with short ribs and noodles and veggies and things. So that's the first mm. thing that comes to mind for mm. me. Now, do do you still have it? No, I haven't had it in a long time. Do you still? No. No. Do you know how to make it? Yeah, I wish. Oh, yeah. I wish I took the time. Yeah. yeah, my mother never taught me those recipes. See, that's that was a big mistake on my part. And I never yeah. really asked. But uh, not that I could replicate it. That's not the point. You really can't. But I, I, But it, it, that's a lost art. You know, when our mom, it, it's yeah. a lost art. It, well, it is what it is. Yeah. In heaven. And have an eternal <laughs> escrow and beans. Who better than me? <laughs> and all the Coca-Cola you want to drink, Excellency. <laughs> yeah, you'll be next to me. You have your Coke. Leave me alone. I have my escrow. <laughs> Fine. You eat oh, it. gosh. All right. Let's see. Um, are priests or nuns allowed to get tattoos? And if they already had one prior to discovering their vocation, would that be a hindrance? No, the answer to that question is absolutely not. If it was a hindrance, no, it would not be. Actually, it's interesting. Lots of people get tattoos now, right? What do they call it? Body art? Whatever they call it now. The truth is, what, what we are stewards of our bodies because our bodies are an essential part of who we are. So you have to be mindful of how you mm -hmm. treat the body. So this is my bias. It's not meant to be a bulletin board. It's not meant to be a political statement. It's not meant to be that, right? Um, so I can't imagine priests and sisters getting tattoos. But does it happen? Could very well be. And I'll give you an example. Uh, a parent dies, uh, a sister or brother dies, and you want to remember them, and you, you, you take on a small tattoo. Would I do that? Absolutely not, because I couldn't do that, and 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 understand myself respecting the body I have. But it's not to say if a person did the tattoo that they're disrespecting the body. It really is quite. It all depends on the the attitude that a person has towards it. But everything in moderation. So you can't possibly be doing what some people are doing, which I think yes. is, yeah. I, it's it's not wise. Yeah. I don't think. Uh, okay, this this question is a little bit longer. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and fascinating. I, and I had never heard the story, but uh, so it says. Not long ago, there was a doctor in the area. After many years, it was found that he never actually graduated from medical school, and he's an allegedly very good doctor. Suppose I was self-taught for the priesthood and I read all that I could and obtained as much knowledge as a bishop. 
and I rented a building and bought some pews and candles and all, uh, and decided to open a Roman Catholic church. And I offered mass. Uh, would that be condoned and recognized? Uh, I don't imagine it would be condoned and recognized, but would it be allowed or legal? No, no, no. And no, no, because you're not ordained. Right now, would it be legal is a different question because I, how the state decides whether something is legitimately an expression of freedom of religion. I, I'm not a lawyer. I do not know, but it would not be recognized. It would be, it's, 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 you're not, you're not a priest. So I don't know what that means. Now, if someone were to say, if I take the question and change it and say, um, I have a lot of, st- I, I'm a man who is not married, who has discerned priesthood and comes to the diocese or the bishop, whomever, and has extensive knowledge in theology and all that. Can my seminary formation take that into account? That's a different question. But your seminary formation is not just education. So you have to be formed humanly, right? Besides theologically, pastorally, morally, so there's no shortcut yeah. is what it comes down to. But if someone decides they want to act like a priest, they are not a priest and it is, is totally yes. invalid, totally yeah. invalid. But do some people create their own churches? Yeah. I guess so. Las Vegas <laughs> may be filled with them yeah. for all I know. Yeah. I don't know. Right. Because it's right? not a – All those yeah. chapels. Because like you said, it's not a function of how much you know. It's, it's a function of not at all. the act of being ordained. And the apostolic yeah. session that comes from You couldn't that. even yeah. – uh, the, the, the listener said uh, they wanted to – if they decided to open a Roman Catholic church, you couldn't even call yourself Catholic without the blessing of the local bishop. No, not at all. No, yeah. absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Right. Because right. I remember I had to uh-huh. I had to meet you, Excellency, and ask for your blessing before we could call ourselves Veritas Catholic Network here. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. But if you go but, – but in some of the inner cities, you do have storefront mm-hmm. churches – but they're really yeah. self-created. And they have titles like bishops and all this. I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, H- has anyone ever painted your portrait? No. I had tw- two offers, which I declined. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The photographs, you, though. You have an official suppose, photograph for the, for the diocese. Yeah, you know what I was thinking, actually, funny you should say that. When I look at that photo, I say to myself, who, who is that man? Because remember, that was, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember if I took an official portrait here. Maybe I did, or maybe oh, it was wow. from Brooklyn. But anyway, it's 11 years old. Otherwise, it's right. 17 years old, 18 years old. So I've grown much older. So it may be time for a more realistic Maybe it's time for uh, someone to paint right? your portrait this time. Yes, falling <laughs> apart, pieces falling off. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's a, but then I don't want to put the, well, maybe, maybe for, um, maybe for the Eucharistic renewal that we're starting, you know, as part of the one is to hmm. update everything to make it more realistic. Right? All right. <laughs> yeah. And then the young Tatiana, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, how many masses do you celebrate on Sunday? And how about an average priest? Mm-hmm. Well, the average priest depends on the parish and the need. Right? The law says you should not celebrate more than two masses a day unless there is significant pastoral demand, need. Some of our pastors celebrate four and five yeah. on a Sunday because there's the need and they right. cannot get help. Ordinarily on a Sunday, I would celebrate anywhere between one and four masses. When I was celebrating confirmations with mass, then easily every Sunday was either three or four celebrations of mass. But, But if you look from Friday to Sunday night, if you look at the celebration of mass and other events like confirmation, other sacraments, in that frame, ordinarily, the least amount of events would be seven. 
the most I've ever had was mm. 13 in that period. Yeah. Yeah, it's busy. The weekend for me is and, very and busy. And we lay people, we're allowed to go up to uh, two masses a day, right, Excellency? You could go to 100 masses a day. You could only receive Holy Communion. Twice. Okay. Right. Yeah. Twice. Right. And it has to be right. different masses. Right. So you go to a wedding, and but if you go to there's three weekday masses, and they're at seven, eight, nine, you only receive once. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. I notice that sometimes when you perform perform mass, when you I'll say I notice sometimes when you offer mass at Saint Augustine's Cathedral, at least during the Vietnamese service, you come prepared with an army of guard like men with fluffy English monarchical hats and swords. Why is that, and how are these men chosen? Those are the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the fluffy monarchical hats, they have been replaced by French berets. A little bit of right? an update. But it's the Knights of Columbus. That is the ceremonial guard, the ceremonial honor guard. And they come with swords because they have sworn to protect the bishop. Now, it's ceremonial but they've sworn to protect the bishop. I very much appreciate mm -hmm. the knights coming. You know, many of them take off Sunday afternoons, one after the other, to be with me for confirmation stuff. And they do it totally voluntarily, yeah. no recompense. So it's okay. really the Knights of Columbus. I wonder if, if they know they look like fluffy <laughs> English Isn't that funny? I'm not no sure way. they find that flattering, but I, but or, the point is, yes, they're in their they're but, in the ceremony. Or maybe they have heard it and that's why they changed to the berets. <laughs> Uh, all yeah, right maybe. um okay uh what what's your favorite pie excellency <laughs> oh oh interesting okay so i have to answer this with two answers if there's crumb on top mm -hmm. it's apple if it's plain pie mm. it's cherry Yourself? i used to love all the pies blueberry cherry oh, my favorite was um Lemon meringue, but again, Ooh. like I haven't had a pie in fifteen years. So, oh, but there's no gluten free. Uh, I haven't had it. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody can let me know where wow. they, I can find a gluten free, dairy free lemon meringue pie. Oh, I'm sure they are. Oh, and everything, everything. And Manhattan has everything. I mean, New York has everything. Uh, yeah, it's got to be. be somewhere. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. Right. Uh, how many shows have you performed so far? Yes, over two hundred. I'm not. Yeah, exactly just recently sure how we many. passed the two hundred mark. Um, Imagine it's it's been way funner than I thought it would be too. Yeah, oh, I'm having a grand old time. It's two hundred hours yes. of conversation. Yeah. Wow. My, yes, you know, and I appreciate the opportunity that you gave me to do this. Really. It's made a huge impact on my ministry. Thanks be to God. It really has. Yeah, it really has. Of course, it's 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 um, it, it's it's made me f understood, and it gave me access to people in a way I didn't mm, have before. Yes. So yeah. I, I very much appreciate. it. And then it. the next question is is on the same. Uh, it's related. It says, "I know you love them all, but what's your favorite type of show to do? Is it when you have a guest?" when you and Steve just talk off the top of your head or when you have a planned agenda or listening listener questions? Well, you know, it's a, that's a great question. I think um, I enjoy listener questions. And with these, and today we kind of categorize yes. them more on the personal kind of, then we have theological questions because they yeah. serve a great purpose, right? They serve a purpose because people begin to, their faith begins to weaken when their questions are not answered. So there's a great theological purpose to that. Our guests mm -hmm. are fascinating. We've had some great guests. And a lot of yeah. times I learn from them yeah. tremendously. Um, I don't think we've ever done a show off top of our heads. Uh, we? No. We always have at least an idea of what the topic is going to be coming into it. Yeah. And then if I, I, haven't, I haven't sent you anything ahead of time, you kind of like really good going <laughs> with the flow. Like thinking to himself, where is this man going? <laughs> but that's right. That... Right, you go. That along, used to really great. freak me out, Excellency, when the, the first few times. But now I, now I, I think I've mentioned this on the air. Now I'm just like, you know what? I trust and yeah. I follow. <laughs> just be just wherever the Holy Spirit is going to land us, <laughs> we landed. Right. 
Yes, yeah, so I, I, I don't know how to answer the question. They all kind of have their own unique. Yes. I like yep. all of them. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Happy anniversary to the Diocese of Bridgeport. Happy 70th anniversary to the Diocese of Bridgeport. There have been uh, settlements in Bridgeport since 1644. It was a borough in 1800, and Fairfield County was established in 1666. So why has there only been a diocese for 70 years? And how were church matters handled before this? Now, I think that may have been 1866, yeah, it must be. Yes, Fairfield it must be. County, right? Yeah, 18. Well, okay, so... Uh, it, it's just a matter of history. When, when the, the Catholic Church was formally established in the United States, the Archdiocese of Baltimore was the single archdiocese of the whole country. Actually, it was a diocese, not even an archdiocese. So from the mother diocese, it has been splitting all along. So in Connecticut, the Archdiocese of Hartford, then the Diocese of Hartford was our parent. So before there was a Bridgeport, there was a Hartford. That is why Blessed McGivney, here in the Diocese of Bridgeport, we asked permission to celebrate his memorial because he was a priest of Bridgeport insofar as Bridgeport right. comes from Hartford. So the answer is, we would have, prior to 1953, it's all the archives records would be in the Archdiocese of Hartford. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, th this one's interesting. Do physical changes to a church or a cathedral have to be approved by the Vatican, or is it simply up to the bishop or the pastor? Well, that's, a, again, a great question because it's a little bit of both. It's not so much that plans for church renovation have to go to the Vatican for approval. They don't. But the different dicasteries have created the guidelines by which churches are built, churches are renovated, how they're structured, how they're organized. So you can't, uh, if you want to be faithful and obedient, you can't just create whatever you want. Right? There's structure and order to it. But most of the actual detail lands on the diocesan level. That is with the bishop. He is also the chief liturgist, and therefore he would approve the plans. Now, in fact, with a lot of church renovations, I've, I've been involved with that and with the, uh, um, the vetting out and the approval and we've had some beautiful church renovations, just beautiful. St. Thomas More in Darien, uh, St. Catherine's in Trumbull, just to name two. There's so many others. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Oh, we did the timing just perfectly, Excellency. Okay, if I, I were it. to ask you and Steve to draw a picture of God or to describe what you believe the image of God to be, what, what would it be? All right, they asked you, you first. Uh, so for me, the picture of God for me has probably changed through different parts of my life, the way I picture him. When mm -hmm. I was younger, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the picture was very much like um, Michelangelo's depiction of God on the Sistine Chapel, you know, flying and mm -hmm. flowing hair and a stern face. Uh, now I, I see him as, as very grandfatherly, you know, because he created me just because he loves me and he wants to be with me and like he delights when I come to spend time with him and just hang out and I just want to sit with him and make him happy so that's oh, kind of how I picture God yeah it's beautiful that's beautiful this may say something about my psyche but I when I was younger I used to image God as a in a human form I don't do that anymore it's interesting. I'm very comfortable imaging God as a beautiful, inviting, glowing source mm -hmm. of light that the closer you get to it, the greater it becomes in a strange sort of way, right? Now, that's because I'm coming older, I think, but also it's trying to be faithful to the idea of a beatific vision because we cannot see the face right. of God yes. directly, remember? Yeah. Yeah. But there's no right or wrong way to image God because God doesn't have form the way we have yeah. form. So, right. yeah, Fascinating, great questions. Huh? So, uh, mm -hmm. this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. We're going to take one more break and come back with my question this time. Be right back. 
Hey, it's Matt from Restless on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Each week on Restless, we young adults restlessly seek the face of Christ in today's crazy and mixed up world. Join us each Friday at noon on 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, the Veritas app, or wherever you get your shows. Hope to see you there. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. All right, Excellency, so at the end of listener question days, it's my turn to ask you a Steve question. So... <laughs> Uh-oh. Not fair. I don't have a Frank question to ask back. Keep going. This, uh, it's just something I'm, you know, I, I'm often curious about stuff. So this is just a... I'm just wondering, Excellency, what are your uh, Holy Week Triduum and Easter plans this year? And then also, like... When I thought of that question, I thought also, is there a particular Easter from the past in your childhood or priesthood that really sticks with you today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, well, thank you for asking. So I will be at the cathedral for Palm Sunday Mass, for Holy Thursday Mass, for both Chrism and the Lord's Supper, and for the Easter Vigil. All right. For Good Friday, I will be at Notre Dame in Easton for the Passion. In the morning, I will be in Bridgeport for the Stations of the Cross and the outdoor procession through the oh, city, wow. which is That's beautiful. Friday morning? Okay. Uh, good Friday morning, yes. Yeah, it starts at St. Mary's in Bridgeport. Last year, wow. we had thousands of people, thousands. And Easter okay. Sunday, we're still working oh, out good. where I'm going to go. Now, my recollection... Um, it's actually not Easter Sunday. My most poignant recollection was Good Friday evening, my first year after being ordained a bishop, when I led the uh, Italian apostolate Good Friday procession with the Stations of the Cross through Bensonhurst. Wow. It was the coldest night I ever remember on Good Friday. And it was done, as it always is done, by candlelight. And it was early. Good Friday was early, so it was it was dark. And there was just something about it that I have never forgotten. It it made real to me the crowds of the gospel. Now these this was a crowd. It was ten thousand people wow. in procession were believers but for the lord they were not but to walk in the darkness that night was just so powerful to me of of that of, of everything we were celebrating wow. and i've never forgotten it i've never forgotten it. wow mm -hmm. okay so Keep sending your questions in on social media or or to questions at VeritasCatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And thank you to our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport. And you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Thank you, Excellency. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. It was fun. It was yes. fun. Next week, serious. Yes. Holy week. Yes. Holy week. So mm -hmm. uh, before we go, could you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to celebrate the great mysteries of our redemption, we ask that you continue to lead and guide us to ever greater repentance and conversion, open our minds to the truth and give joy to our hearts. We ask that your spirit bless us in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Happy Thank Palm you, Sunday, Excellency. my friend. You too. Yeah. Sounds great. And okay. I'll see you next week. Bye.